How does a tortoise breathe? How much is a tulip worth? And how did the ancient Celts put the wind up the Romans? can I read your mind? You can't possibly read anybody's mind. You just can't do it. Your mind is not strong enough to read my mind. I Gareth. think you find it is, Fred. You willing to put money on it? Oh, of course I am. Definitely. 10p. There okay, you now you'll need another 10p for this. Another yes. 10. Right. Now I'm going to look away. Yeah. What I want you to do is to pick up that 10p and grip it tightly in your hand. Yeah. Right? Yes. Now hold it above your head. Hold yeah. it high above your head. Oh, yeah. Because that actually works as a telepathetic aerial. Oh, and telepathic I'm actually, aerial? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm getting the signal. You need to yeah. hold it higher, hold it higher, yeah. hold yeah. it higher. Yeah. Right, okay. Now, put both your hands out in front of you, closed like this. Yeah. And I should be able to tell you by reading your mind. I've got the signal. Carol, very easy. The 10 P is in your left hand. Correct. <laughs> Fred? Oh, you have the 10 P in your right hand. You think so? Mm hmm. <laughs> Clearly, I've read your minds. How? How easy! If you hold something above your head like this, all the blood in your arm actually rushes out like this, and eventually that, that hand will go pale. If you put the two hands together, I can tell easily which one is holding the 10p. It's the white one. And that's how I seem to be able to read your mind, and that's how I win yet another 20p. Thank you very much. Here's a good how for you. How can you spot a fake. How can you tell that £20 note is a fake? There are four ways of spotting a fake. It's got fake written on it. There are five ways of spotting a fake. Fred, but that £20 note's much bigger than a real one. There are six ways of <laughs> spotting a fake. But <laughs> seriously, as fakes go, as duds go, this isn't bad because it's got the broken metal strip down it just as a real £20 note has got a broken metal strip. Do you mm. see that? Yeah. However, when you put light behind these two notes, you will see a difference. On the fake £20 note, the metal strip is still broken, whereas on the real £20 note, the metal strip is continuous all the way through. But how about the watermark, Fred? That's usually a good test. Yes, it? both of these notes have got a watermark. The difference is, though, when you turn the light off, the watermark on the real £20 note disappears. When you hold a real banknote, it feels different somehow because the paper is made of cotton fibre and the print on it in many places is also raised. And here's a clever little device which helps spot duds and real notes. This is a dud buster. Now, of course, a real banknote never goes through any kind of bleaching process, so it stays a dull colour here. The dud one, though, may well have been bleached and it glows. However, even that isn't foolproof, because if you've, if you've got a real note inside a pair of jeans, for example, that have just been washed, it's possible the fluorescence in the, in the washing powder may have come off on that note. Have you got a note? Have your trousers been clean recently? <laughs> <laughs> you know me, Fred. Immaculate. Actually, I have got. Yeah, well, let's try it. Let's just try it, because this is a genuine note, we think. We try that. <laughs> I hope. Oh, yes, it is glowing slightly, indicating that some fluorescence may well have come off on that note. So that's how you can, for once, fool the dud buster. So how can you spot a fake £20 note? Well, you look for the metal strip. You look for the watermark. You feel the paper and the print, and you look for the colour. Oh, and you look to see if it's got fake written on it. <laughs> How can a tortoise breathe? I'd like to introduce you to someone who's no fake. This is Keith the Champion Tortie. Now, Keith leads a rather strange life because tortoises um, often spend a lot of time hibernating. But for other occasions, they can sprint up to 100 metres in one hour. It's quicker than you, that, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> she is extremely fast. But like all athletes, they need to take in 
a lot of air, a lot of oxygen to enable them to run quickly. Now, it's all right for humans because to take in air, we have lungs which are covered by a rib cage. And when we breathe in, our rib cage expands outwards, allowing our lungs to take in as much air as we need. And then to breathe out, they just simply contract. But what about poor old Keith? You see, his rib cage inside there can't expand and contract because it's shielded by this very heavy shell. So what happens? Well, let me introduce you to Terence, the transparent <laughs> tortoise, <laughs> who's one of Keith's favourite friends. And uh, you see, when they're hibernating, tortoises, obviously, their legs are in, the head is in, and there isn't a lot of room for them to breathe. But that really doesn't matter, because when they're asleep, they don't need a lot of air to survive. So what happens when they want to run quickly? Well, of course, they need to take in a lot more oxygen. Their legs come out. The head also comes out. And that gives the lungs a little more room. But when they want to run really quickly, when they need that extra puff of air, they're terribly clever because they are able to shift their internal organs around, enabling the lungs to take in as much oxygen as they require. And in that way, he can win the race. And that is how a tortoise breathes. Here's another windy how for you. How did the ancient Celts put the wind up the Romans? Well, 2,000 years ago, or thereabouts, Rome invaded Britain and forced the Celts, the people who lived here at that time, to the corners of the country, down towards Cornwall, back into Wales, and up to the borders of what would become Scotland. But the Scots Celts put up a ferocious fight and actually managed to stop the Romans in their tracks. How, how did they do it? Well, they had a secret weapon which aided them in this task. And a fragment of that secret weapon, or a beaten up version of it, was found in northeast Scotland in 1816. When they first found it, they thought that it might have been a battle standard or even a helmet. It was, in fact, neither. It was one of these. Wow. Now that is a carnix. And how do you use it? Fred, yeah. I shall need you to help me demonstrate. To the, borders, to the borders. To the borders. Away the lands. All quiet on the edge of the Roman Empire. Not a marauding Celt in sight. Very boring. This will put the wind up him. <laughs> Very boring. Very unfrightening. I can hardly get a note out of uh, this carnix, but I do know a Celt who can. John. Ah! <laughs> Go on, John, play some more. Now, that is a wonderful sound, but John Kenny, when they found the carnix, how did they know that it was, in fact, a musical instrument? There are lots of pictures of them from all over the Celtic lands in Northern Europe, and also there are accounts of them written by people who came to Britain with the Romans. So how did we know that it sounded like that? We don't. But we can make a guess because it works on the same basic principle as a giant bugle, and there are all sorts of instruments all over the world that use this principle today. So how were the carnixes used? On their own? They were used in ritual senses, weddings, funerals, but also predominantly as a war instrument. They were used in battle. People rode horses, steered chariots, playing these things. John Kenny, thank you very much indeed for bringing this in. Now, up to now, no one has heard more than one Carnix being played, as this is the only working Carnix reconstruction in the known universe. But here on How, we figured we'd work out what a quartet of Carnixes might have sounded like. John? <laughs> And with that sound, that's how the Celts put the wind right up the Romans. How much is a tulip worth? Think of tulips, you think of Holland. Think of Holland, you think of windmills, of canals, of the family Vorderman, and above all, you think of tulips. Last year, in Holland, one thousand million tulips were produced. But it wasn't always like that. In 1554, for example, there wasn't a tulip in Amsterdam. Not one. They were all in Turkey, where they were grown for the delectation of the Sultan. But gradually, tulips made their way into Holland, where they became the highly prized status symbols of the very rich, who would often bid 
huge amounts of money to try and get them. Roll up, roll up. What am I bid for this great example of a tulipus, 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 tulipus? And um, I'll bid uh, 300 guilders for it. 300? No, sir, sir, sir. I will bid... 1,500 guilders, 1,500. 1,500 sold, sold, sold so to the lady pretty. in oh. the silly hat. Thank you, thank you. And up and up went the prices of tulips. They became so expensive, it was almost cheaper to make do with a Rembrandt painting of a tulip, of course. But as the prices went up, so the demand went up for more and more exotic tulips. For example, the lovely striped tulip. A roll up, roll up. What am I bid for this prime example of tulipus stripus, I, tulipus stripus? I will give you 10,000 guilders 10, and I will give you my horse. Your horse? I'll bid my house. Your house? It's all done. I'll have your house. And you know, that actually happened on one occasion. A person swapped their house for three tulip bulbs, but then suddenly, bang, overnight, the bottom dropped out of the tulip market. Maybe it was a sort of recession. Maybe people saw sense. Maybe the money ran out. But just like in this country with houses and very expensive cars, the bottom dropped out of the market. And suddenly, it was no longer possible to charge excess amounts of money for a humble tulip. Roll up, roll up. What am I bid for this? Tulipus bulbus, tulipus I'm not bulbus. interested, I'm sorry. I'll give you ten cents for it, that's your lot. Ten cents? OK. But you haven't got a garden to put a tulip in anymore. But suddenly, tulip mania, or the trade in winds, was over. Of course, the tulip business went on, but now it was left to the professionals. The madness was ended. So how much is a tulip worth? How much is anything worth? It's worth as much as anyone wants to pay for it. How can you, or how can we, reconstruct the fourth bridge? A tall order, even by our standards. <laughs> absolutely. Well, let's have a look at the fourth bridge. It is an absolutely beautiful railway bridge, spanning the Firth of Forth. And you can see there the amazing piers and magnificent spans, some of them over 500 metres long and it took 50,000 tonnes of steel to complete it. It's very nice, but how are we going to reconstruct it? Well, we are going to do it using my luggage. Your luggage? Yes. So if you'd like to come over here, because I have a few suitcases that I'd like you to carry, Freddie Garrett. Carry these. Mm -hmm. I'll carry this little one. Mm -hmm. Pick up those two. Yeah, Topic. Um, oh, is that difficult for it's you, It's heavy. It is heavy, isn't it? What about you, Gareth? Well, fine. I'm balanced, Carol. Exactly. And that's terribly important when you consider bridges, because they also have to be in balance or in equilibrium. And you're in balance because you have equal weights and the tensions and the stresses in your arm are equal. All right. I'm in balance. How are we going to reconstruct this oh, bridge? Well, just take that yeah. and, uh, and that one. Yeah. And mind that one because it's full of tulips. And No, you're all right, Gareth. Let Fred take it. No, you, you've got to... And uh, I'll just take that as well, Fred, please. And here is the Firth of Forth. Now, put down my suitcase very gently, please, Fred. And uh, gently, oh, I said, there are tulips in there. Now, put one suitcase over there, one over there. Now, here's something else that we have to know about bridges before we can reconstruct the Forth Bridge. And that is all about the span of the bridge. Now, right. you're the pier or the support. Right, now, take the suitcases. Yeah. And together with your arms, they represent the steel in each span. So right. try and extend the span of your bridge. OK, I'm extending my span. What's happening? Well, the weight's pulling it back down here. Absolutely, but if you had a support here, that would help, wouldn't it? Yeah. Right, so, Fred, are you ready? Oh, now, again. can you take this little bit over here? Because this is going to be the centre of the bridge. Uh, oh, it's heavy. That That's my makeup. makeup. Yeah. So, why uh, is it still that... been open? <laughs> <laughs> put oh, that in there. Please. I need to put things in. Oh. Now sit on the uh, sit on the chairs because you're going to be the piers. The piers? Yes. Now take hold of the sticks, put them under your bottoms because those yeah. are going to be your supports. Yes. Yeah. And now lift. Ah. You're going to be in balance. The suitcase is balanced with the trunk. Yes. And now the train can go quite happily <laughs> over the bridge. And that is how we can reconstruct the fourth bridge with the aid of my brilliant. suitcases. And that. How? How? For now. How? 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 How